This is Twit. One thing that I find really funny is that there's not a good definition, there's not a clear definition of what is IoT, what is good IoT, why. Um, and so I at least try to put a stick in the mud, uh, you know, this is my take on it and this is why. And so um, my answer for what is IoT, it, it's it, at its core, you, you have to have four things. If you don't have these four things, it's not Internet of Things. So it's uh, sensors, communications, computation, and user interface. And the idea being that you have a device, you're going to use it to hopefully solve someone's problem, um, and you're going to pack it with sensors so that it gathers data about the world around us, and then it uses communication to send that data to the cloud where it can actually be useful. In the cloud, you run some computation, extract some kind of insight from that data, and then deliver it to the user through the interface. Um, and so you know, if you look at that and say, like, why isn't a remote control car IoT? Uh, it, it was missing that cloud aspect. You know, every single remote control car is in a silo. Uh, so I grew up playing with you know RC cars, and they're fun. But if you have a couple RC cars, the whole is not greater than the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. But with Internet of Things, that's totally the case. If you have a bunch of IoT devices, all of a sudden they start to make each other perform better. So a simple example of that would be you know. Uh, Amazon does how it makes every other device in the smart home perform better because now you have two interfaces to control your smart lights or your or your door lock. You can use your phone or you could say, you know, well, let's I'll open my open my door, or turn on my lights. So that's that that's uh, part of my work uh, with IoT. And I my latest uh, post has been about something I call the 2080 rule of big data. And the idea being that, ah, there it is, yay. <laughs> uh, so the idea behind the 2080 rule of big data is essentially a, a lot of people, uh, especially with a business background, have probably heard of the 80-20 rule. So if you go down just a little bit, you'll see uh, the 80-20 the rule, the Pareto principle. So this guy uh, named Pareto back in Italy, he noticed that uh, the world is uneven and that um, when he was harvesting the peas in his garden, that the fattest 20% of the pea pods actually held 80% uh, of the peas. And so for him, that meant he could be lazy. This is great. So instead of you know, taking a bunch of time to harvest all the peas, he harvested just the fattest 20% of the pea pods. And then he stopped and he saved a bunch of time and effort because he could have kept going, but it wouldn't have really been a lot of work for very little benefit. And so the idea behind this 2080 rule uh, where is that when it comes to big data, when it comes to the Internet of Things, the Pareto principle breaks. It doesn't work. Um, and it's because when you're dealing with IoT, in particular on data analysis, oh, the x-axis should say analysis. Uh, I guess they haven't posted the updated version of this yet. Um, but the, the key idea is um, that when you're doing data analysis, the first 80% of the analysis doesn't really solve your problem. Uh, you really need to, to go all the way. That last 20% of the uh, of the analysis, that's where you capture a lot of the value, most of the value. Um, and in that article, I kind of go into that. But that's that, I would say, is my um, golden rule, if you will, for IoT and what I really look for in IoT. So one of those really interesting piece of data that was in that the LinkedIn piece was that, uh, let's see, 80% of the world's data what came online or existed I, yeah. in the last two years. So yep. the world's data forever since the beginning of time, 80% of that has been created in the last two years. That was crazy. And when you think, I mean, is that what you're talking about? The 80, like you need to, these devices need to look at all that data. I mean, obviously they're not looking at cave paintings. So, so how does oh. that relate to this story? Sure. Um, so, so those are two different percentages. So we, we shouldn't mix those. Um, but just, to, but the idea though is more to give context. Um, so the, I find it, I love working in tech. I love being at the cutting edge of innovation. And when we're at the cutting edge of innovation, it's really hard to see, you know, what's going on because it's like right up, our nose is right up against it. So my rule of thumb is to say, you know, with 2020 hindsight, which is really clear, what did other people do when they were in a similar situation to me and, and how did the world work? And so um, the idea behind that, that, that piece uh, of the article around 90% of the world's data was created only in the last two years in uh, 2015 and 2016, sorry, 2016, 2017, um, is, uh, is trying to understand that we're going through a paradigm shift right now around data. And 
people um, people say like data is the new oil, but w- what does that mean? Like, how can you think about that, and how can you make that useful? And, and so, the way I like to think about it is, you know, right now we're in uh, 2018, but what if we were back in 1918, 100 years ago, or, or a little bit more? Um, if we wanted to travel back in time before fossil fuels, before oil, and we wanted to enjoy this wonderful lifestyle that we have with like, you know, our, our fancy coffee and our, our fine clothes and all the food that, you know, goes to the restaurants that we just take for granted. If we wanted to enjoy this lifestyle, each of us, we need something like a couple hundred, if not thousands of servants per person. It's insane. It's just like, that makes no sense. And so... Um, if you went back in time, like 150 years ago, and you said to people, wow, we just discovered oil, and it has it, it basically means that man has un, untapped, unlimited access to power. What do you want to do with it? People would probably say something like, oh, I wish I had more candles, or I wish I had more horses. Um, because they couldn't articulate, oh, I want a light, I want a flashlight, or oh, I want a car. Or I want an Amazon uh, Echo. Or I want an Amazon, yeah, definitely not that. Um, <laughs> And, and so if you take that perspective to today, the idea in the article is to say, okay, so now we're in a, this parallel situation where 100 years ago, you know, most of the energy that was ever consumed by people happened in just like the last few years. Up until, up until fossil fuels, all the energy was people and a couple, you know, beasts of burden, but it, it's just, it was just a very different world. I, I really think about it like a light switch going off. Like it's the difference between before and after. And that's around oil and fossil fuels and power. And we're in a situation around uh, data where, again, 90% of the world's data was created in just the last two years. And if you ask, and, and so the question is, what does that mean? Like, you know, if you could travel in time to right now, what would you ask people? And I would say the question to ask people is, if you could know anything you wanted to know, what would you want to know? And because we have all this data, now we can know that. So you guys are up in Petaluma. I'm here in San Francisco. There's this classic problem in the Bay Area of how do you get between San Francisco and San Jose? There's two highways, the 101 and 280. And up until now, uh, up until recently, uh, you had to just guess. And more often than not, you got stuck in traffic. And now, because we have all this data, we have Google Maps and Waze and all these things, you can find out in real time which is the better route, which which one is backed up because there is a traffic jam and which one is wide open you can fly. And the way I see the world right now and the thing that really excites me about the Internet of Things is anything that we want to know, we, we can now know. And the, and the question, the issue is finding the right question to ask and, and going after that. And so um, that that's the other kind of concept uh, in that article. So I walked. I watched a, te- a talk that you gave, and you said that IoT is consistently disappointing in repeatable ways. That you know, that's the headline. That's the popular headline right now. Like, why do we need this? What you know, yep. and and it's disappointing us in in various ways and repeatable ways. Can you talk a little bit about what those ways are and how we can change that? Sure. Um, so in that talk, I, I basically say, give, I give my recipe. Um, I wish I if I. Do this was coming, I would have my, my pig with me because I use that as my example of disappointing IoT. Um, but the, uh, the the key idea behind repeatable ways is if you take that recipe that I gave you, sensors, connectivity, computation, user interface, if you take that recipe and you apply it to IoT devices, I find that the when an IoT device breaks some part of that recipe, that that's where the disappointment comes in. So I, I kind of offhandedly started by saying IoT is there to solve a problem. And th- th- that to me is, is where we, everything starts. You know, if we're in tech and we're doing it right, we're all about solving problems. We're either going like, to make the world uh, stop something awful from happening or we're going to take people that feel just okay and make them really happy. And so if you're building an IoT device, you need to make sure that you're dealing with a high value problem. Uh, how much is high value? If it's for a consumer, I say it should be at least 100 bucks. If it's for a business application, it should be at least a couple thousand bucks. Why? Because IoT is inherently complex. You know, why do I need a, a complicated light bulb or a complicated doorknob um, that if it does, isn't a lot better than the conventional light bulb or the conventional doorknob? So make sure that you're solving a high value problem. Um, and then when with those repeatable ways where it breaks, I've seen devices that have sensors, but they don't really measure a lot of data. That's 
stinks. Uh, I've seen a really common problem I've seen is on the connectivity side. Uh, the connectivity is not easy for, to use. Uh, one of the lines I like to say is that people love their smartphones, but they only like their IoT devices. And so I've seen a lot of companies that design their um, their IoT devices expecting the, tr the user to treat it like a second or third smartphone, and it's just never going to happen. With our smartphones, because we love them, and you can measure how much we love them, because we pay for an expensive monthly data plan, we have this phenomenon where anytime we walk into a new place, we say, can I get your Wi-Fi password? And we're always charging our, our phones. That, that's how you can measure our love. With IoT devices, if you try to apply those principles, especially around the communication side, where you want someone constantly getting it on different networks, yeah, they'll get it on a network once, maybe twice. After that, it's done. You know, I, I've met a lot of people that bought IoT devices, and they told me, yeah, the thing fell off the Wi-Fi twice, and I'm just done with it. I don't care enough. It's because they like their IoT, but they don't love their IoT. Um, on the computation side, that, that also I've seen a lot of IoT devices that they don't extract anything insightful, doesn't tell me, great, so you gathered lots of data, so what? Um, and, and that kind of comes together with user interface. Help me make a decision. So in the uh, 2080 rule article, the way I articulate this is kind of going from a conventional thermometer to a meh, disappointing IoT thermometer to, to, to a really great IoT device. So the conventional thermometer, we've all seen it. It's got mercury. There's no nothing digital about it. You just read the thing. There's no recorded data. It tells you the temperature right in this instant. It's 62 degrees, and that's it. Nothing special. So the whole 2080 rule of IoT doesn't apply. There's no disappointment. There's nothing. Now let's say we IoTify that thermometer. We, we, make, we use a digital sensor to, to measure the temperature. We're sending that data to the cloud. Uh, maybe we'll do a little bit of analysis. And more often than not, I, I see devices where it's like, right now the temperature is 62 degrees. And here's a nice little graph that shows what the temperature looked like the last couple of days. That's disappointing. That is not a helpful IoT device. It doesn't it just spits the data back at the user. It doesn't solve any real problem. Um, it, it's this, I just, I call it just IoTifying for the sake of IoTifying. And for some, for a slice, a very narrow slice of users, they want the cutting edge and they'll pay for that. But for everybody else, and these are the people that I really care about, you're not solving their problem. You're not making their lives better. What problem so, does the pool, the Sutro pool detector um, solve? Um, so it solves a really important problem, uh, which is, is my pool safe? And so, yeah, we could totally use that uh, as a great example of IoT that delights. If, if you look at the status quo today, you have this you know, device, it has, you go out to the pool, you take a scoop of water, you have to manually add some droplets. And even when you look at those droplets, you have to use this color chart to, to match the color of the water to the chart. And it tells you the pH, it tells you the chlorine, but it doesn't actually tell you what you need to know, which is, is my, is my pool safe? So what's great about Sutro is it, it solves the problem completely for the user. It doesn't just tell them your pH is 7.2 and your chlorine is 600. It says your pH is too low, you gotta add you know, three scoops of base to get it up higher and here's how to fix it. And, and that to me is, is IoT that works. Well, I, yeah, I have a smart lock that I really love and I have um, smart, I'm going to say I love, I don't love it like my smartphone, but I really love it. And I also have um, in my house the noon lighting system, um, which you can, uh, it works, it doesn't have light bulbs. It's a system that where you can create different scenes. And I like that. I like that just fine. But I live mm -hmm. in a, a family, my husband is not like any IoT stuff. He just wants stuff to work. So like, how does that factor in where like I can use my phone to control the locks and uh, you know the lights and everything, but he can just, it has to work so that he can also just use the switches and a key. So I'm, you're saying, I'm not sure what you're asking. I'm so asking is like, is that also like, because some people, like when you're talking about a consumer device that you're trying to introduce to someone, it, it, it probably has to do the thing, like my smart lock also, you can open it with a key. Yep. And my lights also, you can open them with, you, know, you can turn them off and on with a switch. So is that an important, like for people that live in a family where some people are more um, more excited to turn things Solid, yeah. uh, on and off with an app and some people just want the switch and the, the lock? Yeah, well, I, so I think that there, there's a, a bunch of things with what you're saying. So what, it, and this comes to the challenge of product design where you have diverse audiences. Like if everybody was like, was just one type of person, 
it'd be a very boring world, but it'd be very simple to design for them. But because, you know, people have families and I live with my fiance and I've IOT if I had my house a bunch um, and she generally goes along with it. Um, it's uh, it, it's a complicated world. And so the I, I think, you know, one thing I, I talk about is having fail safes. So like you said, you know, the, the idea that, you know, if the IoT side fails, you can still use a key. You're not locked out of your own house until the power goes back on or whatever. That's important. Um, the example that I like to give of, uh, you know, the tech enthusiast versus everyone else uh, is this company called Vertigris that I've also been working a bit with. Uh, so Vertigris is this really cool um, IoT system that monitors energy consumption. And for commercial buildings, like like we have them installed here in our office. And the thing that I find so interesting with Vertigris is they have equivalent products on the residential side. And the thing that I find that's really interesting about that, uh, you know, let's say it's like you versus your husband in this case, like you're tech savvy, he's not. Um, for most people, when they try when they try to get something like an IoT energy saving system uh, that they install in their house. They, they have a really bad experience in many cases because the deliverable from the product is a to-do list. <laughs> it's like, you know, now that you've installed your, your IoT system, we're not gonna we're not gonna fix your energy problems, but we'll tell you how to fix them. So now you can take like the next 10 weekends of your life to fix it. For a few tech enthusiasts, that's great. They're like, yay, now I get to IoT file my lights and the rest. But for the average consumer, that's not a really exciting thing. Uh, by contrast, with the Vertigree system, what I think is great is every building of size has a building manager. And that one of the things that that building manager is responsible for is improving energy efficiency and reducing costs. So now Vertigree is telling somebody, you know, you already have this job. We're already paying you to do this. Here is a to-do list that prioritizes what you were going to do already. Um, and I think that's kind of a, a way to... to flip the script, if you will, from people that where, where the IoT product is making their lives worse to where it's making their lives better for people that aren't tech savvy.